please join me in a very warm welcome for Liz Lazar Johnson and Dr. Huang. And Liz, we are going to start with you. Great. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you guys for having me. Um, we've been doing these webinars for a few years now, and I always enjoy it. Um, as Charlene said, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit via Heart Project, and we manage AED programs in California. Uh, we manage over 3,000 AEDs in the state of California, and um, over 800 of them are in schools. So schools and children's heart health is kind of our specialty. Um, and we've been working with the Sequoia Health Care District since 2005. It's been a while. Uh, before I even started the nonprofit in 2010, I was working with Sequoia Health Care District as a, as a consultant. So I have a long history with you guys. Uh, but we do manage the Heart Safe program for Sequoia Healthcare District. Um, if you're out in your community, I'm sure you've seen those wall cabinets that have Sequoia Healthcare District Heart Safe logo on them. And inside is the AED. They have over 300, I'm going to say maybe over 400 in the county, um, in South San Mateo County that Sequoia Healthcare District has helped get out there and, and we manage and make sure that they're ready for use at any time. So I'm going to tell you just a brief overview of why we do what we do. Um, again, I'm not a doctor. Dr. Wong is, so I'm going to take the, the layman's approach to explaining all this. Um, I, I give a lot of presentations to high school and middle school kids, um, so that's kind of where I'm used to talking. Um, but what we're here to talk about is sudden cardiac arrest. And sudden cardiac arrest kills over 350,000 Americans per year. And just to put that into perspective, Breast cancer kills 35,000. So that's 10 times more than breast cancer. It's more than breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and AIDS combined. And almost 10,000, if not more, of those are children. Um, so when normal, um, most of the people that pass away from cardiac arrest or experience cardiac arrest, I should say, are um, over 65. Um, they have uh, heart disease um, or some type of heart uh, issue, a uh, heart attack can lead to cardiac arrest. A lot of times the media switches the two, but a heart attack's more of a plumbing problem in the heart, whereas cardiac arrest is an electrical problem in the heart. Um, children experience cardiac arrest usually because they had an undetected heart defect that nobody knew about, and that leads to cardiac arrest. We just saw another instance of cardiac arrest uh, when you get hit in the chest with a ball at the exact right moment, um, like Damar Hamlin did on Monday Night Football recently. Um, so there's several different ways cardiac arrest can happen to somebody. Um, but when you go into cardiac arrest, you only have a couple minutes before your brain starts to die because your heart stops beating normally. Your heart's been beating normally all these years and it goes into this electrical malfunction and all of a sudden oxygen's not getting to your head, getting to your brain. And so your first sign is basically passing out. And when you pass out from cardiac arrest, you only have four to six minutes before the brain starts to die. And after that, every minute that you go without being saved, without defibrillation, you have about a 10% less, less chance of survival. So if the nearest ambulance is eight to 10 minutes away, your chances of survival are under 80% or under 20% uh, flip-flopped. It's a very low chance of survival for cardiac arrest because ambulances aren't just next door. They usually take eight, nine, 10, if not more minutes to get there. And the only effective treatment for cardiac arrest is defibrillation. You have to shock that person with a defibrillator. CPR is very important because CPR keeps that brain alive. It keeps the oxygen going to the brain and it gives us more minutes before brain damage starts to occur. So you're basically giving that person more minutes until defibrillation arrives. So our choices are to wait for an ambulance or the first responders to get there with their defibrillators, or you live in Sequoia Healthcare District and you have AEDs all over the place in community centers, in the schools, the shopping malls, in the patrol cars, they have AEDs. So you wanna go grab the nearest AED and apply, and basically once you grab the AED out of the wall cabinet, there's about eight or nine different models and they all do exactly the same thing. There's an on off button, and then you press the on off button, it starts talking to you and tells you what to do. So I always wanna to stress to people never to be afraid to use an AED. My daughter, when she was three years old, could use an AED correctly. Now that she's 10, she uses it faster than I do sometimes. Because <laughs> you press the on off button, you listen to the voice prompts, you apply the 
the sticky pads to the chest exactly like it's shown in the pictures there. And then the AED will analyze the heart rhythm and determine if that person is in cardiac arrest or not. And the lovely thing is there's no way to shock someone who's not in sudden cardiac arrest. So there's no override switch on an AED. There's no way to hurt someone with an AED unless you don't use it. Um, you can't hurt somebody by using an AED. There's no way to accidentally shock someone. So the AED will analyze that heart rhythm and determine if they're in cardiac arrest or not. And if they are, it will emit a shock. And if they're not, it won't. It's as simple as that. And it's very important for you, the rescuer, that you've put the electrodes on and you, you've uh, let the AED shock them. And then the AED is going to analyze every two minutes and keep giving shocks as shocks are needed. And you keep doing hands-only CPR, hopefully between those shocks to keep the brain, to keep the oxygen going to the brain. And then EMS will come and take the pads off. And that is how we want the chain of survival to work. We want it to work where you see someone go down, you call 911, you start chest compressions, you get the AED. And if you do that, their chances of survival increase significantly. So the Average chance of survival in the United States right now for cardiac arrest, every 100 people that have cardiac arrest, about 11 walk out of the hospital. And some of that is with some moderate brain damage. So that's a very, very low statistic, only 11. Um, if you have communities that have strong cardiac arrest programs, like they have defibrillators like Sequoia does in the healthcare district, in the patrol cars, in the malls, in the schools, et cetera, uh, you can get that survival rate up to about 48%. Um, Rochester, Minnesota is a great example of that. They um, have AEDs within six minutes of everyone in the city, and their survival rate is over 48%. There is one place in the United States that beats Rochester, Minnesota. Um, it's the place that has the highest percentage of cardiac arrest saves, um, and that is casinos in Las Vegas. So if you're at a casino in Las Vegas and have cardiac arrest, you're in luck. Um, it's absolutely your lucky day because you're on camera. Most of the time you're in a casino unless you're in your room. And the casinos have uh, the safety and security uh, have competitions every year to see who can save the most people with their AEDs. So I actually know somebody who was at a casino in Vegas, experienced cardiac arrest, and before he hit the floor, at that blackjack table before he hit the floor, they were there with an AED and saved his life. So it's very important to get the AED there as soon as possible. Now, one of the things Via Heart Project does besides managing AEDs is we do heart screenings on kids. So we like to treat with the AED and then prevent with finding the heart defects before they lead to cardiac arrest. We've been doing heart screenings all over the Bay Area and Northern California since 2015 now. Our first one was actually in Sequoia Healthcare District in 2015. And now we screened over 7,000 children in Northern California for heart defects. And we've found 82 um, with uh, heart issues they didn't know about before. And so part of our program is to continue to come back to different districts. Uh, Sequoia is definitely on our list to come back and hold another heart screening event and screen your kids for heart defects. And we'd love to do that sometime soon. And I think that's all I have. And I'm happy to come back for questions at the end. Thank you so much, Liz, for that information and for the really, truly life-saving work that you do. We are proud to be part of a community and organization that offers AEDs that really save a lot of lives. Thank you so much, Liz. It was fantastic. All right. And now up, we have Dr. Henry Huang, who is here with us again from Dignity Health the Sequoia Group, Sequoia Hospital. So Dr. Huang, you are up next. Uh, can all of you hear and see me? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my slideshow presentation. Uh, Perfect. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for having me as a speaker tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all. It's a real privilege to be with the Dignity Health Sequoia Medical Group. Um, I've been a part of the Dignity Sequoia community now for uh, a little over three years, although I've been a cardiologist for much, much longer than that. Um, 
as a general cardiologist, I see patients in the office and in the hospital. Uh, I see everyone from young adults to the very elderly. Uh, I do a lot of diagnostic testing for heart disease, um, prescribe medications when it's appropriate, uh, refer for surgery if it's appropriate. Um, and I'm happy to have the chance to um, provide you all with a better understanding of heart health. I hope my slideshow presentation today um, gives you a better understanding uh, of heart health than before. So um, without further ado, let me go ahead and start. So every now and then something happens in public that gives us a frightening reminder of our own potential vulnerability to life's events. Um, pictured here on this slide is Damar Hamlin, a football player for the Buffalo Bills who collapsed without warning during a televised football game last month. Um, he suffered some sudden cardiac arrest and had to be resuscitated with CPR and an AED or defibrillator before he was rushed to the hospital. Unfortunately, his immediate emergency medical treatment has allowed him to recover well. Um, nonetheless, an event like that makes us all wonder about what we should be doing for both athletes and non-athletes. Um, it, re it reminds us all of the importance of heart health. Uh, we certainly want to avoid the serious consequences of heart disease, like sudden cardiac arrest. Um, conversely, we also need to consider all the benefits of having a healthy heart. Um, you know, having a healthy heart uh, allows us to have improved athletic performance if we play sports or do any sort of exercise. Um, a healthy heart allows us to have increased energy, better overall health. And so um, we need to be thinking about ways in which we not only reduce the risk of heart disease for ourselves, but also how we can give ourselves the benefits of a healthy heart. Uh, so my objectives for you for my talk today are to give you a basic understanding of how the heart works, uh, uh, for you to know the possible symptoms of heart disease and what to do, to recognize the cardiac screening requirement for student athletes, um, and to make dietary changes to maintain heart health. So for greater context, um, we need some basic understanding of how the heart works. Um, the heart is like the engine of our body. Um, it's a special organ that pumps blood with every beat, uh, allowing blood to circulate throughout the body. Uh, it's about the size of a clenched fist and it's comprised of four chambers, uh, upper and lower chambers on the left and right sides. Uh, the upper chamber of the heart is called the atrium and the lower chamber of the heart is called the ventricle. So, you know, we have a left atrium and a left ventricle and a right atrium and a right ventricle. Um, and these four chambers of the heart um, have walls that are made of muscle and the contraction of the muscle allows the heart to pump blood. And on this next slide is a schematic illustration of the different heart chambers. Uh, this is a section of the heart as viewed from the front. And so this, <clears throat> you know, this is the right side of the heart. Uh, RA is right atrium, RV is right ventricle. Um, the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs through the pulmonic valve. Um, and blood in the lungs picks up fresh oxygen. Um, the oxygenated blood is then returned to the left side of the heart to the LA or left atrium. And then it flows through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. Um, and the left ventricle pumps the oxygenate, oxygenated blood out to the rest of the body through the aorta. The aorta is the main artery of the body. And so, um, this blood supplies all the fuel that the body cells need to function. After the body cells use up the oxygen and nutrients in the blood, then 
the used blood returns to the right side of the heart through um, the large veins of the body. The blood, used blood returns to the right side of the heart for the cycle to begin again. <clears throat> and there are electrical signals that stimulate uh, our heart muscle to beat. Um, these uh, electrical signals are conducted through the heart by a specialized cardiac conduction network that you can think of as microscopic electrical wiring that conducts electricity throughout the heart and the ele electricity then stimulates the heart to beat in a, at a certain rate and in a certain rhythm. Now, um, the heart has its own blood supply. The heart um, has its own arteries uh, known as the coronary arteries that supply blood to the heart muscle. The coronary arteries, like any arteries, are like pipes that supply blood to the heart muscle. And uh, in this illustration, we can see the right coronary artery that supplies blood mainly to the right side of the heart. And, and then there's the left main coronary artery splitting into the left anterior descending artery and the left circumflex artery with these arteries supplying the left side of the heart. And so, as you can see, there are many different components to the heart as a functioning organ. So there are a number of areas where dysfunction can develop, as listed here. Um, you know, in other words, there are a variety of heart disease conditions that can develop depending on what part of the heart is affected. So one can have uh, heart muscle dysfunction that leads to um, symptoms of heart disease. Um, one can have heart valve dysfunction, where the valves inside the heart become leaky or unable to open well. One can have um, congenital defects of the structure of the heart. Um, one can have abnormalities of the electrical conduction system of the heart that affect heart rate and rhythm. Um, <clears throat> one can certainly have abnormalities of the coronary arteries that lead to heart disease. Uh, also possible to have pericardium disease. The pericardium is a sac that contains the heart. It's, it's the sac that contains the heart and abnormalities of the pericardium sac can lead to heart disease. And then finally, um, heart disease can result from other medical conditions that are going on. And for example, if one has an excess or deficiency of thyroid hormone, that can then lead to heart, a heart condition. So what are possible warning signs or symptoms of a heart condition? Um, here on this slide, I've listed the uh, common symptoms that can potentially be, be related to heart disease. Chest pain, shortness of breath, unusual fatigue with physical exertion, palpitations, uh, sudden lightheadedness or fainting, especially during or after exercise. Um, all of these are potential heart symptoms that deserve medical evaluation before normal activity can resume. Uh, certainly before uh, a student athlete can uh, resume exercise. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, as Liz mentioned, um, one can develop a life, uh, a life threatening emergency that occurs without prior warning. Uh, in other words, sudden cardiac arrest when the heart suddenly stops beating. Um, if you know someone collapses and is unresponsive, um, that person needs to be treated for sudden cardiac arrest and acting quickly is critical as time is of the essence. If someone um, if, if someone has sudden cardiac arrest, remember to call, push, and shock. Um, Call meaning uh, call 911. Um, you or someone else has to call 911 to activate emergency medical services and um, have paramedics come to render emergency aid. Um, push, referring to CPR uh, or doing chest compressions in order to help 
maintain enough circulation for the patient to survive. And then shock meaning uh, finding and using an AED or automated external defibrillator. Um, and as Liz mentioned, this is a, a machine that gives the heart an electric shock to restart the heartbeat. So call push and shock if someone has cardiac arrest. Now, uh, the next question is, is, is there anything that we can do to help prevent sudden, sudden cardiac arrest from happening? And is there a role for doing screening tests in asymptomatic people to try and detect heart disease that could cause sudden cardiac arrest before that happens? The answer really depends on the patient population. Uh, I'm aware that tonight's audience is uh, very interested in heart health for the young student athlete. Uh, for young student athletes, there are guidelines for cardiac screening that exist to help identify conditions that could affect one's ability to safely participate in sports. Um, the specific guidelines for medical screening can vary depending on the country or region, uh, as well as the type of sport and the level of competition. Um, in California, the state guidelines for cardiac screening of student athletes are set by the California Interscholastic Federation in accordance with uh, American Heart Association and American Medical Association recommendations. And according to these guidelines, um, all student athletes participating in interscholastic sports should have a medical history review and phys physical exam before starting competitive sports and an, on an annual basis afterwards. And this is very important uh, to help detect any uh, unrecognized heart disease um, because oftentimes uh, there are warning symptoms before sudden cardiac arrest happens, but they're not properly recognized. And so um, this sort of medical history review and physical exam is an important part of trying to detect heart disease before something like cardiac arrest happens. And a physical exam can certainly help to detect uh, signs of heart disease that wouldn't otherwise uh, wouldn't otherwise be recognized. Um, <clears throat> there has been substantial debate about the role of screening tests for student athletes. Um, but I, I do encourage uh, student athletes to have a standard 12 lead EKG as part of their screening evaluation. Uh, an EKG is, or electrocardiogram, is a simple, quick, and easy test that takes all of five minutes to complete. And it can give us potentially useful information about uh, someone's cardiac health. Uh, depending on the results of an EKG, depending on the results of the medical history and physical exam, additional testing such as an echocardiogram may be needed in certain cases. Um, an echocardiogram is an ultrasound scan of the heart that tells us about the structure and function of the heart. Um, and so uh, these are all things that should be kept in mind. Um, here on this slide, on the bottom half of the slide is a picture of an EKG being performed. Um, the e <clears throat> there's uh, an EKG machine uh, with electrodes attached to the patient's chest uh, so that we can uh, detect the heart's electrical activity and uh, record it in a printout that allows us to analyze the cardiac information. And on this next slide is what the doctor sees when an EKG is completed and printed out. On the top half of the slide is an example of a normal EKG. Um, again, this is a, a normal standard 12 lead EKG printout. And then on the, on the bottom half of the slide is an abnormal EKG that shows a condition called long QT syndrome. Um, 
uh, I don't think that you have to be a cardiologist to appreciate the significant differences between this abnormal EKG and the normal EKG above. Um, long QT syndrome um, results in uh, specific EKG abnormalities that signify an underlying electrophysio electrophysiological condition, um, an electrophysiological condition that predisposes one to potentially fatal heart rhythms. And so an EKG can detect something like long QT syndrome um, that would otherwise be unrecognized. And so I do think that there is value to doing EKGs for screening purposes. Um, now, um, I've been talking a lot about uh, what can go wrong with the heart um, and, and what to do if there is uh, signs of heart disease. Um, but now I'd like to shift the focus um, and discuss more about what we can do to maintain heart health. Um, these are tried and true methods of maintaining heart health on this slide. Um, exercising regularly, uh, a heart healthy diet, sufficient sleep, avoiding tobacco and drugs, I mean, these are all tried and true ways in which we can maintain a healthy heart. Um, and <clears throat> what comprises a heart healthy diet? A heart, a heart healthy diet should be mostly vegetables and fruits. So the majority of a heart healthy diet would be vegetables and fruits. A heart healthy diet also includes whole grain and high fiber foods. Uh, fish and lean protein rather than red meat, and fat-free dairy products. And in the next couple of slides, I want to give some more specific details about what we can do to make our diets more heart healthy. So <clears throat> here are some of my tips for making your diet more heart healthy. Um, instead of drinking sodas and fruit juices, um, drink water instead. Um, our bodies need water in order to function properly, and water is a zero-calorie liquid that allows us to live our healthiest lives. Um, instead of high-sugar snacks, substitute fresh fruits and nuts. Instead of eating starchy foods like pasta, potatoes or fries, rice and bread, substitute fresh vegetables. And in <clears throat> And instead of using the whole egg, use egg whites without the egg yolks. <clears throat> you also want to watch how much you eat. Do limit your portion sizes and thus calories, especially at dinner time. Um, at nighttime, we tend to be less active, and so we tend to burn less calories. And not having so many calories at dinner time uh, helps to maintain our metabolic health and thus our heart health. Uh, also important is the first meal of the day. Always eat breakfast. It helps jumpstart our metabolism for the entire day. Um, in cooking, cook with less oil. And instead of using butter or margarine, margarine uh, use olive oil or canola oil. It's important to pay attention to ingredient labels. Oftentimes, you're, you may be surprised by how much sodium is in a particular food product or how much fat and cholesterol is in a particular food product, and you wouldn't otherwise know unless you pay attention to the ingredient labels. And you also want to include at least 30 grams of fiber every day. Um, oatmeal or oat bran are good ways to help uh, ensure enough dietary fiber for yourself. Um, meat should be a minority portion of your diet. Um, and when you eat meat, you want to choose lean cuts and trim the fat. The leanest beef cuts are sirloin, chuck, loin, and round. Uh, lean pork cuts would be tenderloin or loin chops. Um, you want to avoid organ meats such as liver, which are very, which is very high in fat and cholesterol. 
when eating poultry, you want to choose white meat over dark meat. Um, choose turkey or chicken over duck and goose. Um, and you always want to trim off the skin and fat. And I think making these sorts of choices will help to uh, reduce your dietary cholesterol intake. Try to include at least two servings of fish every week um, and avoid fried anything in your diet. Um, <clears throat> uh, like meat, dairy should be a minority portion of your diet, um, um, but choose fat-free milk and yogurt and avoid high-fat dairies such as ice cream, butter and margarine, and cheese. When you prepare food, when you cook, prepare and cook food for yourself at home, you have so much more control over what goes into your body. Um, when you dine out, uh, you have much less control over uh, what you're eating. And oftentimes, what you get is much less healthy and um, uh, much higher in sodium, fat, and cholesterol. Um, so limit the frequency at which you dine out. Avoid, avoid the fast food chains. Um, when you do dine out, it's okay to ask for less salt and oil to be used by the chef. Um, you can also ask for any sauces and dressing to be placed on the side so that you control uh, how much sauce and, and dressing is uh, ultimately used on your food. Um, to help restrict your calorie intake, pass on the bread basket or only eat whole grain bread. And don't feel compelled to finish everything on your plate. You can always uh, get a takeout container or doggy bag, so to speak, to bring leftover portions home. So hopefully um, these are tips that will be helpful to you in terms of making your diet more heart healthy. Uh, in conclusion, um, I urge all of you to seek help if you have any symptoms of heart disease uh, or if any family members have symptoms of heart disease. And I wanna urge you to make heart health a priority. So that concludes my talk and I'm open to any questions that the audience members might have. Um, happy to answer any and all questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Huang, for that incredibly information-rich presentation. We are all better for it. We'll be thinking more about heart health and what we eat. Um, so please, audience, if you have questions, put them in the chat, if you would. We have some that have come in earlier that I'll start with, but do feel free to add anything. Questions for either Liz Lazar from the Via Heart Project or for Dr. Huang, okay? All right, let's let's... Let's get going. Um, you touched on this, but I just want to clarify. Dr. Huang, do you think that all student athletes should be screened for heart issues? And is heart screening mandatory for all school-based sports? So, so yes, I do think that it's important for uh, student athletes to be screened for heart disease before they start participating in sports. Um, and uh, it is something that is a requirement. Um, uh, you know, I think that uh, the, the question also included um, whether or not uh, this sort of screening should happen on uh, a periodic basis. And, and yes, I, I know I do think that our bodies can change over time and it is appropriate for uh, screening to happen not just before a student athlete starts sports, but on an annual basis afterwards. Um, and what's required as far as screening is a medical history review and physical examination. Um, I also think that it's a good idea for student athletes to get an EKG as part of their screening um, because an EKG can potentially develop any. Uh, an EKG can potentially detect any important heart issues that might be relevant to um, sports safety. Um, so 
uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, you know, I, I don't think that we do enough screening. Um, and I think that more and more people are coming around to the idea that, you know, screening is a, an important way to help make sure that our student athletes are safe. Exactly. Thank you very much. Linda, why don't you unmute and ask your question? You can even put your camera on if you want to. Hi. Yes, good, good evening. And thank you so much for a very, very important topic and discussion. So I actually have um, uh, two questions. One is, is this automatically the screening um, automatically done by the primary care physician when an adolescent comes into the office and says that they are an athlete and they will start participating in athletics? Um, and would this start in middle school or it's not mandated into high school? And then I'm wondering also, um, doctor, if you can um, uh, talk about the difference in the symptoms um, in women and in men um, for cardiac symptoms, if there is something that begins to malfunction. Thanks so much. Thanks for letting me ask a question. Thank you, Linda. Good I'm question. happy to address the, um, the screening question, if you'd like. Sure, um, Linda, go ahead. So, so right now uh, in the state of California, uh, EKGs are not mandated for um, any uh, child. Um, their heart screenings or their pre-sports participation physicals, as Dr. Wong said, include a heart history um, review, a health history review, and a, a physical. That's like a vitals check, uh, et cetera. So unfortunately, that kind of um, physical does miss birth defects, the only way to... to find a birth defect uh, in the heart defect is, um, is with an EKG, an echocardiogram, or just an EKG finds many of them. And there is one school district in the state of California now, it's in San Jose, that has mandated EKGs for all their athletes. Um, there's an organization called the Kyle J. Taylor uh, Foundation, started by a, a mother who lost her son, Kyle, to cardiac arrest. And they are doing um, EKGs in the school district down there for all the athletes um, now. And there's several other school districts now that are coming on board and um, thinking about requiring it as well. But this is high school athlete um, that they're requiring. it. Now, we always say uh, it's great uh, when someone's 12 uh, to, to start getting EKGs. Um, but that's not the only time to get one because your heart's growing and changing through puberty. And so some, some heart defects like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, aren't, um, aren't visible until they're fully developed, until they're 17, 18. So we usually, when we do heart screenings on kids, suggest they come back every other year for, for a screening. Um, and not just the athletes, but all children, ages 12 up. Thank you, Liz. Um, Cat is disabled. I'm sorry. Chat is disabled. Oh, let's check that out. Shouldn't be. All right. While we're checking into that, because obviously you can't add your questions, Dr. Huang, do you mind commenting on Linda's question about the difference between men and women in terms of their symptoms? Yeah, so women and men can present differently um, for heart disease. I mean, um, women's symptoms can be less typical or less classic for heart disease compared to men. I mean, oftentimes when we think of uh, heart disease symptoms, we think of, you know, crushing chest pain, um, an elephant sitting on someone's chest, that, that type of feeling. Um, but, but women can experience chest pain that's uh, not classic and uh, not necessarily um, the, the sort of crushing pressure or heavy type of chest pain that men do. Um, I think it just points to the importance of being vigilant and attentive. Um, you know, I think that we have to uh, do a very good job of listening to the patient and listening to what kind of symptoms someone is experiencing and just and being aware that maybe the symptoms that someone is experiencing uh, may not be the most typical symptoms that we think of for heart disease. And 
you know, since women can experience heart disease symptoms somewhat differently than men, I think we have to be aware of that as a doctor. Um, I think we have to be uh, aware of that and attentive and um, have, and we have to have a high suspicion for heart disease in order to um, detect uh, heart disease that would otherwise go unrecognized. Um, the, the saying is that you can't find something on, you know, unless you have your uh, antenna, antenna up for it. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, that's, you know, um, that's part of the challenge of, of medicine is, you know, not everyone experiences disease the same way. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Yes, you know, I, I think that um, we have to be attuned to the fact that women can experience heart disease symptoms differently than men. Um, you know, I think it's something that all, all of us healthcare providers have to be attuned to. All right, we've got- Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. We have got the chat working, everybody, and questions are coming in. Here's one for you, Dr. Huang. What is the correlation between high cholesterol and heart disease? I know that's a great question. Yes, so high cholesterol is something that increases the risk for heart disease, um, specifically coronary artery disease. Um, what can happen over time is that uh, someone with high levels of cholesterol in the blood can develop cholesterol deposits in the walls of the heart arteries, um, what we call cholesterol plaque buildup in the walls of the heart arteries. And as time goes on, if there is enough cholesterol plaque buildup, it can cause a narrowing or blockage in the artery that limits blood flow to the heart muscle, which can then lead to symptoms of heart disease or other cardiac complications. One can also develop um, cholesterol plaque buildup in the heart artery wall that doesn't necessarily reach a critical point, but that plaque can suddenly rupture to cause a sudden blood clot in the artery that then leads to a massive heart attack. And so, uh, you know, making sure that uh, we have cholesterol, um, making sure that we don't have high cholesterol or that our high cholesterol is brought under control is an important way for us to prevent coronary atherosclerosis or coronary artery disease. Um, and so that's why high cholesterol is such an important risk factor for heart disease. All right, we have some questions coming in about diet. I think this is a really good one from Elaine. Um, Dr. Huang, the diet suggested sounds great and doable for adults, but for teens, 12 years to 18 years, it seems unrealistic. What one or two things are the most important in terms of a diet that a teen can realistically accomplish? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, you know, you know, I would I would certainly I, I would I would certainly want any teen to avoid um, junk food, highly processed or packaged foods. Um, I would certainly want teens to avoid fast food as much as possible. Um, you know, knowing that it's not always easy to control a teen's behavior. Um, but you know, I think that would be the the single most important dietary consideration for. Uh, an adolescent or, or teen. Um, and I think it's especially important for the student athlete to have a healthy diet. I mean, um, you know, having a healthy diet is something that actually helps to enhance athletic performance. Um, you know, if if we have um, a health, if, um, if an adolescent or teen has a healthy diet, um, you know, one, um, you know, one that includes um, fat, fresh fruits and vegetables, it'll give them much more energy um, and allow them to perform better in whatever sport they, they play. And so I think that's an important message to convey to our kids, um, especially, you know, 
our our student athletes. It's not just a, a matter of being able to get away with an unhealthy diet at a young age. Um, it's actually a matter of um, following the kind of healthy diet that improves our physical performance and also uh, allows us to have more energy and concentration in school. Okay, thank you for that great answer. So this question is for Liz and maybe Jenny. You have been the drivers behind getting so many of these AEDs into, especially the Sequoia Healthcare District community. When those machines go in, who all gets trained? How does that happen? I'm happy to take that. Um, so it depends is the, is the answer to that question. Um, so the state of California doesn't require necessarily anybody to be trained on the use of an AED um, because they are so easy to use. They're made for people who don't know how to use one. Uh, but we always do offer CPR and AED classes to wherever we place an AED. And we do like for everybody to have at the very least a heart saver class that um, goes over hands only CPR and how to use an AED. Um, I can show someone in 15 seconds how to use an AED. So it's really easy. But the important thing for the class is the CPR aspect of it, because that is something that that's, you know, it doesn't talk, there's nothing talking you through CPR. You need to learn how to do that and how to do chest compressions. Now, is there a fear factor, though, if that machine is in a library or a public place, do people go do it? Is the hardest part just opening the box? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The hard, A lot of AEDs don't come off the wall because people are afraid to use them. And that's what we try and stress more than anything is you can't hurt someone with an AED. You've got the good Samaritan law on your side as long as you don't do anything grossly negligent or outside the scope of your training. You're protected under the good Samaritan law. And um, there's no way to hurt someone with an AED unless you pick it up and throw it at their head. Don't do that. All right. I mean, we found out with Damar Hamlin that there's an incredible team of trained physicians on the field at NFL games. I don't think we all knew that either, did we, Dr. Wong? Yeah, you know, it turns out that the, the team that responded to Damar Hamlin's arrest was comprised of um, team trainers, uh, as well as physicians. And certainly the paramedics came very quickly to help resuscitate um, Damar Hamlin. Um, you know, and I, I would say that, um, you know, the, the paramedics who respond to 911 calls are able to you know, bring additional equipment um, that is helpful in a cardiac emergency. Um, and, and that's why calling 911 is such an important step. Um, you know, whether, um, whether, whether you're the one that starts CPR um, with someone else calling 911 or the other way around, uh, calling 911 is you know, a really important part of, you know, getting the necessary life-saving treatment to someone that they need. Uh, I would encourage all of you to learn CPR. Uh, CPR is a skill. Um, it's something that you know uh, you can get trained for in a, a BLS class, basic life support class. Um, it's it's as a skill. It's it's not something that can be learned through a, a Zoom video presentation. Um, you know, but I, I would say that it's an important skill to have and. Uh, I would encourage all of you to learn CPR skills. Um, you just may be able to save someone's life in the future. I do want to um, take this chance to let people know that we will be offering free CPR classes to Sequoia Healthcare residents, um, hopefully starting in April. We had a pause. We used to offer free CPR to residents for several years. And then um, the last class we had was in December. Uh, we are partnering with Red Cross to offer these free classes to the community. So if you are interested in a CPR class for yourself or a loved one or a refresher on CPR, please check back to, um, to our website for free registration starting in April. Okay, great. Thank you, Jenny. We had a question about that in the chat. All right, we have time for just another couple of very quick questions. Let's see if we can do it. This is, I know, one that many people share. If there is a history of heart disease in the family, will it affect my children in the future is the question. 
death in the family related to heart disease? So it's possible. Um, it depends on what kind of uh, family history there is. I mean, certain conditions do have a very strong genetic inheritance pattern. Other types of heart conditions don't have um, such a, uh, a strong one-to-one um, uh, -one inheritance pattern. Um, so it's a great question, um, but the answer is that it depends. It really, it really depends on uh, what condition is in the family history, um, which relatives have been affected in the family. Um, but family history is an important part of the medical history review for student athletes. Okay, thank you. So we are very close to the end of our time together, but Liz and Dr. Huang, I wanted to give you each a minute just for some final thoughts. Liz, do you mind if we start with you? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, in summary, I'd say if you have a student, uh, a child between the ages of 12 and 25, I would definitely, um, if they do sports especially, suggest an EKG for them. Um, we'll be coming to uh, San Mateo County sometime in 2023 to do a heart screening event where we screen up to 500 kids in one day with EKGs and um, health history reviews and all of that. Um, so we're looking forward to coming back to the area to do that. And my other big takeaway, I hope, is if you see an AED and you see somebody that's unconscious, don't be afraid to use it. Grab it off the wall, put it on, can't hurt them. Thank you, Liz. Great, great final comments. And Dr. Huang, we'll let you have the last word. Um, <clears throat> uh, if, if you or a family member have any symptoms that are suspicious for heart disease, don't be afraid to get checked out. Don't don't hesitate to, to get check, checked out. Um, it's always better to be safe than sorry. All right. Well, thank you everybody, all of you for joining us tonight for this very important conversation on understanding heart health. A big thank you to Sequoia Healthcare District and to Liz Lazar and to Dr. Henry Huang. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Stay well, stay safe, and we hope to see you again soon. Good night, everybody.